full disclosure, I just heard some of my PR machineries put out being read out here. Actually, the only thing I'm famous for is that I've been the journalist who was fired more than anybody else in the history of South Africa. And fired by the best. I was fired by Business Day and by the Financial Mail and by the Sunday Times and the cherry on top. I was fired by Dr. Snooki Zikalala at the SABC. And all for insubordination. A um, bit of a warm reception, or shall I say hot reception. I'm from the Cape. And guys, we, we've Catonians, we don't like to brag, but can't you guys get it together? When I left Cape Town, it was 32 degree, uh, 23 degrees. And I get here and it's 37. I mean, don't you control anything? <laughs> um, I had a chat with a few uh, people before and now during tea time. And I wasn't surprised to find people deeply depressed about our future. It's rough out there. It's rough out there as we speak. There are stun grenades at Parliament and UWC and UCT and Masipimulele is burning and all over and by now possibly a few other places because I only checked at 9 o'clock. But this is exactly the wrong time to be depressed about South Africa. This is not a time for negative emotions. This is the time for, of, of great opportunity, a time to unleash new energy and new ideas a time for leadership and an active, active citizenry. Change and innovation, you would agree, we need that desperately. Change and innovation do not flourish in a stagnated, stable environment. Well, we don't have a stable and stagnant environment right now. I truly think, and that's what I want to talk about today, I think we are on the brink of something new and something better in South Africa. South Africa is not about to become a failed state, a banana republic, or another Zimbabwe. Unless, of course, we all lose all hope and we retreat into our separate corners, allowing hatred and intolerance to fester. It is a good idea, I thought, to remind you of what we looked like 30 years ago. We were in a much, much worse state. Trust me, I was in the thick of it. During the second half of the 1980s, from 85 onwards, South Africa was isolated from the world with sanctions and boycotts. Our economy was virtually bankrupt. We had boycotts on our social, cultural, and sporting life. The international community declared this country's official policy a crime against humanity. When white people like me traveled abroad, we were ashamed to say we were from South Africa. I always tried, uh, when I was in the 70s and 80s overseas, try to affect my already bad Afrikaans accent so people would think I'm from New Zealand. <laughs> it didn't work. We had one state of emergency after another in the 80s. We had, at one stage, more than 10,000 people in jail without trial. Hundreds of leaders were on Robben Island. Um, the ANC and PAC were banned organizations. They waged a war from our neighboring states. We were not allowed as South Africans to know what they were thinking. We were not allowed as journalists to quote them. I did once in 1988. I quoted Joe Slover, and I got a lengthy sentence and a stiff fine for it. The townships were burning then every day much more than since 1994. There were thousands of people on the streets Every day, mass protests, mass marches, and most of these turned violent. Bombs were going off all over the place. I don't know if some of you recall that when we, in the late 80s, when we had, went to shopping centers, we had to go through metal detectors. There were bombs in restaurants and shopping centers all over the country, and the AWB was running around stoking racial hatred and threatening war. It was, it was a really ugly, ugly time. My own experience was, the security police blew up my office in 1989. Um, they sabotaged my car, and the military intelligence operators tried to assassinate me on two occasions. Military intelligence being what they are, they obviously failed. <laughs> so, in reality, we were on the brink of a devastating civil war. 
the 300 years of bitter conflict and dispossession and oppression were about to culminate in a full-blooded racial war. And so what happened then? The leadership of the two opposing forces decided to negotiate a way out of the conflict. And here's the point, we, that, what, that, we all know that, but here's the point. If they did not have the support of the majority of South African citizens, if this was not what we were feeling as a great mass of South Africans, they would not have succeeded. And so we got the settlement of 1994, our splendid constitution, heralding a new order of openness and tolerance and democracy and growth. And South Africa was the darling of the world because we had proved that a nation can overcome the gravest of challenges. I think we overestimated ourselves. I think we underestimated the challenges. It wasn't going to be that easy. Because 20 years later, South Africa, South Africans are deeply unhappy nations. We, nation, we have violent protests in squatter camps every day. Now even universities. Unemployment is higher than ever before, even than before 1994. The liberation movement that had governed us so far has split into different factions. We have, over the last year, witnessed the, the sharp rise of cheap populism and reckless rhetoric. People with an affinity to violent solutions dominate our political stages. The very foundation of our economy is being rejected by some of these reckless politicians, demanding the large-scale nationalizations of mines and banks, industries, and agricultural land. Their bottom line, and this is the bottom line ultimately of what we are talking about in South Africa today. Their bottom line is they want the property clause in our constitution to be scrapped, section 25 of our constitution to be scrapped, making it possible for the state to rob citizens of their property. And that is our fundamental challenge, is to turn this country around, to turn the society around in such a manner that we still would respect private ownership of property. Because the minute we go past that threshold, then we are on a slippery slope. So the post-1994 order is now in crisis. It's now unsustainable. The Rainbow Nation was an optic illusion after all. You've probably heard the quote, a much abused quote from an Italian philosopher, Antonio Gramsci who famously, a long time ago, said, uh, the old is dying, but the new cannot yet be born. And in the interregnum, a number of uh, morbid symptoms appear. This is exactly where we are right now. Um, but we are a long, long way away from what we were before we became a democracy, from that dangerous time before 1994. Why would we then collapse into a failed state uh, collapse as a nation? Uh, why would we now, now that we are politically free, throw it all away and, trans and, and descend into a Zimbabwe-type chaos? I don't follow the thinking. I, we're not going to. I think we're on the brink of something really new and better. The old order is dying, and we're going to create a new one. We have to make, we have the fantastic opportunity to guide this birth that is happening as we sit here. Uh, to make sure that the process is peaceful, or relatively peaceful, and that the new order that we're creating, that when this baby grows up a little bit, it'll lead to a more just and more stable and more prosperous South Africa. It is indeed time for a whole new pact, a whole new dispensation, a, a, a new pact between government, citizens, labor, and the private sector. And I think it's an exciting prospect. We get another opportunity to imagine a new future. And this time we can do it while peace and stability are still intact. We could wait. We could say, well, let's procrastinate like we've done in the last few years, and then be forced to change with blood flowing in the streets. And what we are about to do, what we have to do, will require a lot of energy and commitment, a lot of sacrifice, I would say, a lot of listening to each other's ideas. But the advantage is we know what the mistakes were, were that we made since 1994, and we can fix them. We have the building blocks ready 
for a new dispensation. And sure, you might say, last time, the first transition, we had champions of the people like Nelson Mandela and even F.W. de Klerk. And sadly, that is true. We don't have that kind of leadership. Um, poor leadership, in a sense, is what brought us to, this, to where we are right now. But here's my, my little theory. As these messianic leadership waned when Mandela went down and then Mbeki went down, and then we got a new leader that doesn't get the respect that his predecessors did. See, I've learned some diplomacy. I can say, some, <laughs> I can say nice things too. Um, as the, the, the leadership waned, the citizens are coming up. I'll talk some more later about the, 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 the reactivation of civil society. I, I do think we have grown up a lot since, uh, since, we, since 1994. We don't need a messiah anymore. Our strength today is not in leadership, but in the people themselves. We are much better equipped as a nation to solve our problems. Our weakest, our strongest leaders are now in business and, strangely enough, in the faith communities. And we'll get back to business leadership again. But so why are we so depressed? Why, when you go out there, it's, it's doom and gloom. You go into social media and it's like everybody who has a few cents will want to pack for birth. Or, you know, the, the standard issue is we become, we becoming Zimbabwe. I think what we, we've been doing is in do, instead of doing a sober audit of um, positives and negatives of our strengths and our weaknesses in the nation, we've just talked each other into a depression. And, and it coincided with the emergence of things like Facebook, a little bubble where your worst emotions can be uh, made public. Uh, we don't go much deeper than the screaming headlines in our increasingly declining print media and our increasingly bad television stations. We see the visuals of angry mobs in, at universities and townships. We see the chaos in parliament and the reckless rhetoric and the abuse of power and the electricity blackouts and the water shortages and the general decline. And we think, there we go. First thing that we have to remember is this decline that we're seeing in our society is not unique to us. When, when the developed world, when the first world defines you as an emerging market, you, to, be, to put it plain, you're screwed. When something goes wrong anywhere in the world, emerging markets get the flak first. Um, and look around uh, to some of the other countries struggling, countries that you can compare with us, Greece, if you want to be really depressed, go to Greece, because there's no, seemingly there's no way out. We, at least we have a way out. There's stuff happening, and we're thinking, and we're talking, and we're moving. That's just a dead-end street. Turkey has the same problem. Russia, uh, Italy, Portugal. Um, even Australia is, is, is struggling, and it's such a model society. It, it's, uh, it's currency has been hit as badly as ours in the last few months. We South Africans look at our deeply flawed president and his inner circle of abuse uh, and say, that's what South Africa has become. We are on the slippery slope. We are the Zuma nation. And we become paralyzed like a rabbit in the headlights waiting for the bullet. We've stopped believing in ourselves and we've stopped believing in our own potential as our nation, as a nation. And we've stopped believing in that famous, that thing that made us famous, not only over the last 30, 40 years, but over the century, centuries, is the resilience of South Africans. We stopped believing in that. We think that Jacob Zuma and, and Julius Malema define us as a people. We forget that 15, a short 15 years ago we said, Mandela, defines us. Politicians def don't define people. They just, government of the day, they come and go, the strengths are in us. So what happened is most of us have lost the ability to distinguish between what is deplorable and what is dangerous. What is 
likely to go wrong, wrong in the society and what is highly unlikely to go wrong. There are truly few problems in South Africa that leadership and good citizenry, active citizenry can't fix. And I'm, people accuse me when I say these things that I'm trying to put lipstick on a pig. <laughs> we are facing challenges. I, I can't um, fool you. We all see it. We're facing uh, severe challenges, and it will test our stability severely. It's going to be rough out there, especially if we don't become very active. The, and the unfortunate part is that um, at the very moment that our internal pressures are at boiling point, our economy is coming under extreme uh, external pressure because of the, essentially because of the slowdown in the Chinese economy and the decreasing uh, commodity prices. And then there's the crippling droughts, uh, drought in some parts of our country. We don't have control over China. As I said, Australia is suffering equally under that very uh, problem. But there is one overwhelming positive that can be taken out of the recent developments in South Africa. The hegemony of the ANC has been broken. And I'm now not trying to make anti-ANC propaganda. I'm not targeting the ANC. I'm saying part of our problem over the last 20 years was that we were a one-party democracy. One party dominated our entire society. Well, we can say now, no more. We will not be dominated by one party once again. The logjam has been broken. The protesting students, this is, we're talking about tomorrow's leaders of business and government, took their fight to parliament, they took their fight to the ANC headquarters at Lutuli House, and they took their fight to the union buildings. Nobody had done that before. So fees must fall became Blade must fall, and Zuma must fall, and ANC must fall. And it started out about being about uh, university fees, but quickly refocused. And I saw uh, a, a formulation by one of the VIT students the other day. He said, Mr. President, we are unhappy with the way you and your government have been treating the citizens of this country. We are angry at your corruption and self-enrichment we demand that you fulfill the undertakings given in our constitution. And that's what it's now about. It's not about university. It's not about free education anymore. It's much more. I was listening to a, a student, a female, young female student on Reddy Tlawi show on 702 uh, day or two ago. And she wasn't one of the leaders, so she didn't have a little statement that she read out like this other dude. And, and really asked her, so what is this about? Why are you so fired up? And she said, Listen, I don't care much about politicians. We are simply demanding that we become an awesome nation again because we're not awesome right now. And I thought, I'm with that sister. We are not awesome right now, and we want to be awesome again. Didn't it strike you uh, over the last few weeks when the student protests started? Didn't it, the quality of young people strike you? It certainly did me. The, the young people that I interviewed myself, I saw interviewed on, on television and radio, the, the way they articulated their problems and the broader society, I was mightily impressed. And it's one of the things of the last two months that I, as a boring old fart, started mixing with students again. I'm so encouraged by the quality of young South Africa. When I was, 22, 23 years out at university. I, I wouldn't, I didn't think those things. I was just interested in girls and beer. Um, so suddenly we have an aware bunch of very sharp young people and that, that is excellent for our future. So nothing focuses a politician uh, like a threat to his power. And we're about, uh, we're building up to a situation where the ANC will get a bloody nose in 2016 uh, with the local elections, and they will possibly, if the trend continue, continues, they will get, they will dip below 50% in 2019 when we have a general election. And already next year, the, the politics of coalition will begin in earnest. We haven't seen any of that, apart from one or two small municipalities. But we're about to see the politics of coalition. 
Because the ANC will not, I predict, get an outright majority in Johannesburg, in Pretoria, in Port Elizabeth, um, and they already don't have it in Cape Town. So what will you then have? The EFF has grown spectacularly, in my view. It's hard to pin this down because we, we have no way of testing it. My gut feel says, says to me they have at least doubled their support since they got 6% of the vote in 2014. Um, and they're growing. And if we thought they're just a bunch of, of ill-disciplined riffraff, they marched to Sampton. I don't think there were quite 50,000, but it were at least 30 to 40,000. And the impressive thing was they were absolutely disciplined. It was the most disciplined march, mass march, we've seen since the big marches in September 1989. Now, if you can control 40,000 young people in the streets of Sampton, then that says something. So they will do well. The DA is growing everywhere because they have the massive advantage of saying, look at how we are running Cape Town, the Western Cape, and many of most of the, of the municipalities in the Western Cape. And people are saying, when it comes to a general election, I want to go for the party that deserves my loyalty, the party of my father and my grandfather and my whatever. When it comes to local elections everywhere in the world, but specifically also here, people are much, find it much easier to say, no, I'm voting for better housing, better refuse removal, no potholes. That's what I'm voting for this time. It's not ideology. So one can expect the DA to break through the 30% mark uh, in support. So what will then happen? Will the, will the EFF go in coalition with the DA? Or will the EFF go in coalition with the ANC? We don't know. They don't know. This is uncharted territory. We've never done this before. But what we, what, the reason why I'm mentioning it is we are at the, also at the beginning of a total realignment of politics, party politics in our society, because what we have now is completely artificial. If you take the ANC, for instance, you have ultra-conservative ethnic nationalists right up in the highest office, but you also have the Communist Party being very prominent, and everything that an ethnic nationalist says should be anathema to a communist. We have um, capitalists, we have socialists, we have constitutionalists, we have majoritarians, all over the place. It's, it, it, it made sense 20 years ago to have such a broad church. It doesn't make sense anymore. Um, we're beginning to see the same thing happen with the DA, that maybe there, there's a bit of an artificial unity there. And maybe there will be a split. And I think it's quite possible that in 2019 or the election after that, 2024, we could see a government, a coalition government of the ANC proper, the, the middle of the ANC, and the, and the left middle of the DA. Um, that could be our next government. And that is normal, and that is natural, and we should work towards that. So I said we haven't done the, uh, the, the uh, audit of the pluses and, and, and the positives and the negatives. What are these building blocks that we have to work uh, with to build a new South Africa, and what are the mistakes that we should not repeat? The first massive negative is the plight of the black youth, the product products of 20 years of utterly disastrous education. Some people call them the born freeze, and I, I think you know, it's, it's a term we all use, but it really isn't an appropriate term for these people. There are 27 million of them. More than half of our nation were born after 1990. Um, I've got some statistics here from the Institute of Race Relation. 20% of these young people grew up without parents, either because of HIV and AIDS, bad parenting, or because of um, the migrant labor system that somehow we thought it's okay to still have 20 years into democracy. Uh, I refer you to Maya Khanna. Unemployment among these young people is 67% for males and 75% for females. You're sitting with millions of young women and young men, no skills, 
not properly literate, no hope of a good job and a decent life ahead. Only 16% of the 20 to 24 year olds will go to university. Of them, only half will get through uh, with a diploma. Here's the, the statistic that concerned me most. A third of South Africa's prison population are between 14 and 25 years old. But the other negatives, do you want me to list them? you want me to talk you into a depression? We have the most expensive state bureaucracy in the world, and I would add one of the most incompetent ones. 14 cents out of every rand that the government spends uh, goes to paying civil servants. State-owned state enterprises have performed disastrously and cost us billions and billions of rand. Can I list them for you? Escom, Prasa, Petra, SA, the post office, the SABC. Uh, we dump our money in there. Uh, there has been a, a very dangerous pub, uh, and systematic capture of public institutions by the inner circle of our president. And among this, the, the, the SARS, the Hawks, the National Prosecuting Authority, the SABC. Um, corruption with all these bodies um, co-opted, there can't be a, a proper investigation into corrupt, corruption and tender fraud and nepotism and so on. And something that had concerned me a lot, um, we've been witnessing a creeping authoritarianism the last year or so with the rise of these Zuma-aligned um, securocrats. It's, it reminded me a bit when he talks in Parliament when they block the signals and when they do this and that and they send their spooks into the SABC and stuff. He talks about the security cluster. The president talks about the security cluster, now the ministers of justice and police and defense and so on. And it just so reminds me of P.W. Boerta who had his, his uh, new national security management system that also ran the country outside of Parliament because he believed there was a total onslaught. So, it's not a pretty picture. And here comes the and yet. The biggest and yet is that we remain one of the most open societies outside of the Western, big Western democracies. And sometimes I can say including them. Um, and if you travel like I do to all continents, you'll know that this is true. This is truly one of the most open societies. You, you can see, you can use one barometer. Go to our talk radio. You go to listen to talk radio in a place like, Hol place like Holland um, or, or the United States. In the United States, talk radio is a right, far right-wing phenomenon. Talk radio here is truly instant democracy. We call with our worst prejudices and our worst fears and we voice them on air every day, 300 days in, in, in a year. And we have people like Reddy Tlaby and Tim Odise handle it. It's instant democracy and it, it, it is, people who come here from elsewhere can't believe the kind of things that we say to each other. The media is still completely free, freer than most societies. Also, we are much freer than America, for instance, in terms of legislation limiting what we can write. And almost, almost as importantly, everybody from the extreme left to the right has a position, has a place, a presence in parliament in the system. So you don't have the situation which we're seeing a little bit of, of people operating outside the system. Um, we saw that in the 1980s. We talked about extra parliamentary politics and they were more important than parliamentary politics. And if you will forgive my crude crudeness, but it was an American president who said that. And, and it's very applicable um, to us now of people like the EFF. He said it's much better to have your enemy inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. <laughs> and we have everybody in the tent. Uh, and they're doing their business sometimes in the tent, unfortunately. <laughs> so modern history uh, tells us that open societies never fail. There is not an open society on record in modern history that has become a failed state or collapsed. So what you have to do, and, and there are a few examples of that, is, is take a, an open society, gradually oppress it, gradually close that down, and then it become, become that. Can you see anybody closing down our openness, taking away our freedoms? Can you see that we will allow it? Can you see the young people will allow it? 
Um, I was in, in, in Turkey um, some months ago, and a little scandal broke with the, the president. And if you think we have a bad president, you can't see theirs. Uh, he, his Nkandla is ten, 10 times bigger than our Nkandla. Anyway, he was, there was a, a campaign on Twitter, and people said um, the, the president, Erdogan, stole, stole the money, and this is the proof. He got up the next morning and he said, this is unacceptable, I am banning Twitter. And he banned Twitter. If anybody stood up in South Africa and said, I'm banning Twitter, we will just fall off our chairs laughing. Some things are not possible in South Africa. And it's a major, major thing. I, I have traveled uh, post-conflict societies uh, over the last number of years. I'm a member of an organization called uh, the Global Arts Core, based in, in New York. And what we do is we try and bring relief to post-conflict societies with theater and dance and music and poetry. And so I visited countries in the last seven, eight, nine years, like Bosnia, Herzegovina, and, and Serbia, and Kosovo, and Croatia, and Rwanda, and Burundi, and Zimbabwe, and Northern Ireland, and Cambodia. And every time, and we do workshops there with perpetrators and victims and, and everybody. And every time I come to back to Oa Tambo and I walk back into South Africa, I am bowled over with the goodwill that remains in the society. And other people also from outside say, why, how come you're not killing each other? It's such a better, better history. And how come all the promises of the last 20 years have not been kept? You still have, the, the, the black is still poor and the white is still rich. Why aren't you killing each, each other? We have, for some reason, through our culture and our history and our people and our leadership, we have retained a certain minimum of goodwill that is, uh, or let me say, an absence of hatred. I, I just saw this morning that the Institute of Race Relations did um, a survey recently, and they asked something like 5,500 black South Africans, do you think race relations are better now than in 1994? And I, I would fully expect them to say no, because our expectations have risen so much. And almost 70% of them said yes. Interestingly, only 40% of white people said yes. But you know, we, we have this to work with. What are the building blocks? What are the pluses that we sit with that we can build a new, a new society on, that we can do a new transition? We have no ethnic tension. We have no tribalism in the society. Now look around in the rest of Africa. Look at Eastern Europe, the ethnic and, and, and tribal problem. We have no regional tensions. I, I used to be fond, to go to, fond of going to Ukraine. It was a lovely society. And I hadn't been there for like 11 years, and, and I still have mates there, and they just tell me now that place is destroyed because that country is divided in two, and the East and the West, and the Russians came in, and most people uh, on the East loved it, and it's destroyed. It's a, it's a, civil, it's a civil war. Same with uh, Nigeria. We have no threat of ter terrorism in South Africa. You know how big deal that is? Not even our neighbors, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, those countries can't say that. Most countries in, in, in Europe, most countries in the West can't say that. We have no problem with religious fundamentalism because Muslims in South Africa are not recent arrivals from somewhere else. Muslim South Africans came with slaves and, and political exiles in the late 1600s. And they, are, they have been part of our nation for almost 400 years, for more than 350 years. So, uh, for one, they started the language that I speak at home. Afrikaans was started by Muslim, uh, Muslim people in the Cape. So we don't have that. We have a fantastic infrastructure. Now you can moan about that. As the president said, we, we're not Malawi. Well, we, he was right, we're not Malawi. This is, this is quite remarkable. I travel a lot and sometimes I sort of overbooked myself, and not too long ago, I, I really double booked. I did a breakfast in Cape Town, I did a lunch meeting in Johannesburg, I did supper in Durban, and I slept at home in Cape Town. 
in one day, thanks to airports, the Gout train, things like that, it's, and, and good roads. Our constitution is intact. We talked about the, the, uh, the property clause, section 20, 25 of our constitution. Our constitution is intact. Our constitutional court is as awake uh, and as active as they were right in the beginning. Our judiciary is still completely independent and it's functioning. Functioning. The point is, if we, if you want to change the policy, the, the section 25 of the constitution, you need 75% of the votes in parliament. I cannot see anybody getting 75% of the votes of, of the seats in parliament again. And people can try and sneak it past, but we have a constitutional court and a, a strong judiciary, as we've seen in the last few weeks and months, and as we are seeing right now, the president is facing the constitutional court in three different court cases in the next few months. So here's the magic, and something that I occasionally feel I have to, exp to explain to our president and some of our cabinet ministers and other politicians, we are not an ordinary democracy. We are not a majoritarian democracy. We are not a parliamentary democracy. Most other countries are. We are a constitutional democracy, and there's a big difference. The difference being, you can have 99% of the votes and the seats in parliament, but if you make a law or appoint a person that goes against the spirit of the constitution, the constitutional court will strike it down, as they have, as they have. And we need to hold on to that. There's one more plus that I think we have, and I saw that during a visit to Egypt earlier this year. And, and you see it in Zimbabwe, you see it in Nigeria, you see it in a lot in the South American states. We do not have a culture where the military look over the shoulders of the civilian government. The, the civilian government is not scared of the military. We never had that tradition, even under apartheid. Uh, the apartheid defense force and police, I'm sure they were not happy with what de Klerk had done. And yet, when he handed the power over to Mandela, there they were, and their helicopters were flying over because they served the government of the day. We also have the advantage that our military does not only consist of Mkontavisizwe, of the ANC. It consists of old defense force, the, the so-called old homeland defense forces, um, and, and APLA, the Zanian People's Liberation Army people. So they're all in that mix. And it's a massive plus that the military aren't playing any role in our society. My timer has gone to sleep, and now I don't know how much time do I have. Do I stop? <laughs> Let me give you uh, uh, quick examples of bad news, of good news hiding behind bad news. People say to me, yeah, but Zuma's getting away with Nkandla. The point is, he didn't. It cost him and his party dearly. Nine years later, it's still the albatross around his neck. We have won. We, the people, have won. People say to me, yeah, but they now they want to silence the media. Yeah, they wanted to silence the media. But, and they had the, the, the Secrecy Act, and we formed organizations like the Right to Know campaign. We forced them to rewrite it four times, and now it's kind of okay. So the story is not they want to silence the media. The story is the media, the, the people have won the battle. They're attacking the judiciary, and that's a big concern. Okay, well, that's not the real story. The real story was that the Constitutional Court, the Chief Justice, called them out, said, you can't do this. I demand to see the president. They had a meeting, and it was resolved. So we're talking active civil society, the business sector, and so on. Um, and, and that becomes more and more important. So there is an air of expectation and excitement uh, at the moment. And often, in my last thought, often I'm asked, what, what can we do as ordinary citizens? And I say, well, be good citizens, be caring and be sharing and be active, make sure your voice is heard. Let's form a critical mass of reasonable, pragmatic people that believe in a just and prosperous state. But more importantly, is my advice, and I find this surprisingly the advice that people appreciate most, is take care of yourself. Um, Consolidate your affairs. Thank you. <laughs> now it comes alive. Um, 
Take care of yourself. Consolidate your life. Look after your friendships. Look after your relationship with your wife and your husband and your children and your friends and your colleague, colleagues. Look after your health. Go for walks uh, with the dogs in the park. Just rediscover what healing properties nature uh, can have. Take long weekends with your family. Make yourself strong. Um, if you're drinking too much, drink less. If you're not drinking at all, please consider the value of a good whiskey every afternoon. <laughs> If you're banting and it works for you, well, I would say occasionally eat a good pasta. <laughs> so what we need, what this nation needs more than anything else is more sweetness and more happiness and more gentleness and more, a lot more love. And if you are mentally and physically strong and healthy, you will be in a much better position to handle the bumpy times ahead because bumpy they're gonna be and you will be able to be a part of the solution instead of becoming uh, one of the victims. I imagine a new South Africa after this, a post-Zuma uh, South Africa. I imagine one where you're gonna have a 6% growth, where you're gonna have pay 10 rand for a dollar, where, where we will look each other in the eye in streets again and say, yes, we, we, we all happier. Uh, this is working better. Um, I, I can imagine that we can walk, we can go overseas again and hold our heads high like we did under, under Mandela and, and a bit like uh, under Mbeki. And that's the South Africa that I would want to work for and I hope that you will work for because it's also going to be a South Africa that's going to be good for business. Last advice, really reliable uh, safety belts and strong seasick pulls because choppy seas in the next at least until the election of next year. But I think Ship South Africa is structurally strong enough to take us there. Thank you. Thank you. Stay there, stay there, stay there. Okay. So, a couple of scenarios, but I think that we, we have a good chance to get it right, because we've got the right kind of people, I guess, in the country to get the job done. So, any questions? Maybe two at the most. Time's on our side. Big questions? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised they all agree with me. <laughs> oh, Never right. happened so, before. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing about the, the pictures that you paint, it, it all depends um, who is the next set of leaders and who is, what does the citizenry do next? I mean, like we saw with these students, there was a wave where we were all proud and very excited. And then somewhere along the line, some people hijacked this process. How do we make sure that the right kind of leadership, the right kind of citizenry comes through and doesn't get hijacked by terrorists or whoever wants to, to sow discontent? Well, we are human beings. We're not different from any other society. So I am still impressed. I'm still proud of the student movement. And, and the, the, the heart of that student movement did what they had to do, and then they, they're now writing exams. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of hooligans running around and burning down stuff, people who don't want to write exams, but mostly I suspect people who are not at university. So keep on believing in the students' cause, the way that they said we are, we do not care who the political leaders are. We are now standing up and demanding that we want an awesome South Africa. And let's not be sidetracked side by the guys around. And let's not forget that we do things the violent way in South Africa. If you don't kick up a fuss, nobody listens to you. So there's a cult. If you look at the, the, the strikes we had, for instance, of the municipal workers and the security workers, Every time, if every few years we have a security worker strike and at least 9, 10, 11, 12 people die and they burn down parts of the city. So it's part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the violence has been very little, apart from the last few days. Mm -hmm. But we have to also understand why does it happen at Fort Hare and UWC? Why doesn't it happen at Tux and UJ so much anymore? Those are all explanations. So we need to be open to to try and understand better than we have before what is really going on. 
But I just want to say on your thing about the leaders, well, we are seeing the slow exit of President Zuma. He's either going to leave in 2017 when they have to elect a new, new leader. Um, the way I saw him perform in KwaZulu Natal on the weekend tells me he's desperate. He knows his days are numbered. But if he pushes very hard, he will be our president until 2019. That's not long. And, and we know now he's, he's losing his powers. He's a sitting duck. Um, so the rats are jumping off the ship because he's not going to be the president for much longer, so the rats are now looking for a new ship. Um, so this whole house of cards is crumbling. We don't know if it's going to be such a lot better, but we know the present systems of patronage and corruption and, uh, will, will, dif the, the, will, will be different. The SACP, the Communist Party, will not be so prominent in government anymore. So all these things will, should tell us, and, and, and brings me back to the students, we, the citizens, have more power than we mm. thought. And it's a special lesson for business. Uh, business leadership is to also come to the party, be slightly braver, be slightly more innovative, and come with new ideas. And, and if you have to break the old rules, if you have to bring Julius Malema with you, do that. I see he's asked a couple of things, it's demanded very strongly, that a, the, the Anglo-American supports at least 100 students, and the fact is they support 1,000 students. Mm. He didn't know. So we need to sort out all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we need to sort out all this stuff, and the power is yeah. back with us. Okay. Uh, one last question. Yeah, Dion? Um, just want to find out, do you think um, South Africans are, are sometimes painfully polite, especially even if they've got bad stuff you want to say? Sorry, uh, I said South Africans are, are generally very, very polite, and in a restaurant you're not going to complain even if you get bad service. But do you think we've seen civil unrest and, and, and protest about non-service delivery come through from peri-urban areas, from townships, and you're starting to see the, the resistance about e-tolls, and now you see fees must fall, and how quickly the students were able to, to change people's minds. Do you think this kind of civil voice is now finally moving into... Um, the suburbs and, and, and that civil voice will now uh, take motivation from that and say, we're not going to stand for this any longer. Yes, absolutely. I think that, that is the essence of the, the big difference that the student voices made because they were highly civilized, they were very sexy dressed in, in designer clothes and they were very articulate and they were very passionate, they were very sincere and they were very fired up and they didn't take no for, a, for, for an answer. So what they have suddenly said to us, it's not only the people in the squatter camp who uh, complain. We can all now complain louder. I, you know, to be honest, uh, I think white South Africans have learned an awful lot from black South Africans. But the one thing that black South Africans can learn from white South Africans is to complain more, to bitch more, because white people can com seriously com I mean, they, they seriously can complain. <laughs> <laughs> and black people just like roll their eyes and, okay, we'll let it go. They should learn. It helps to complain. Um, and the other thing that we saw with the students is with, uh, there was virtually no organization, which is why partly it went haywire towards the end. Uh, it, too much of it was, was uh, impulsive and, and unorganized. But we started seeing, and I saw this at Bloemfontein University, white students, without being organized, without being part of COSAS or SASCO or the ANC or the Youth League, just ordinary white kids got up and said, I kind of agree with this, and why shouldn't I walk with these people? So it's kind of a, a spontaneous non-racialism that we haven't seen in 20 years. Yeah, I think we are, uh, we are less polite, and it's a good thing. And who do we have to thank? Mostly Julius Malema. He broke. He broke the taboo uh, to say, you can actually stand in front of the leader, the 73-year-old the leader of the ANC, and say, you're a thief. Um, because before that, we didn't do it. He, he taught us that it's OK to be disrespectful. Um, and I think we will one day say he, Julius Malema and his party, expanded our freedom of speech quite a lot. Well, until the day I think they come to power, then they will 
shrink it very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Max Dupree, thanks so much. Thank you.